directed at, you know, we've kind of prefaced all of this by talking about God's forgiveness of us and how important that is. And we, we've looked at the, at, at the nature of that, the, 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 how, how, how critical it is that we have that opportunity of forgiveness, uh, how, how deep uh, is that need for us. And, and now we're starting to look at one another. And, and our relationship with one another and the fact that there will have to be forgiveness that, that will sometimes come into play between you and I. And, and then to, to put a perspective on that um, and, and to, to have the correct um, uh, view of that as, as we move forward with one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So, uh, we're, we're asked here to be tender or to, 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 to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Why? Because this is how God has dealt with us. Uh, he, has, he has those qualities, those qualities in this verse that we're asked to have are first illustrated by him in so doing in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 in verses 12 and 13 we read, uh, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So once again, great comparison is made between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiving of one another. And that's, that's quickly becoming a theme in what we're going to uh, be focused upon uh, but but notice once again uh, all of those attributes all those those attitudes in verse 12 uh, it put on a heart of compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience bearing with one another forgiving one another I mean I, so many times I fear that the thing that we portray is not one of those characteristics uh, and, and it should be uh, regardless of of, of what's happening or what's going on, we should be able to, to illustrate those compassions as a Christian or those, those attitudes, if you will. Um, Matthew chapter 6 is a verse we looked at very quickly last, last time. Uh, I think there's a lot here, and I wish I could spend, I, I'd like to just spend a lot more time on this, but very quickly, Matthew chapter 6, uh, the, forgive, the forgiveness basics here seem to be Outlined, and, and this is even within uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Remember, uh, his disciples come to him and they ask him about prayer. Uh, Jesus gives them some warnings and he says, uh, Do not be like them, verse 8, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. I find that so interesting. Uh, Jesus, in illustrating to his disciples how to pray, tells them, or rather reminds them, if you will, that, that God knows what you need before you ask for it. Now, I think so many times is the case when I consider prayer, I think, I think prayer is really more for my aspect than it is for God's. It's not that I'm informing God of something or that I'm telling some, him something I don't know. But so many times, and I don't know if this is the case with you, but when I start a prayer, I go to him with a desire. I go to him with something that's really on my mind or hurting me or causing me um, anxiety or, or, or maybe grief or maybe... Uh, a, a torment or whatever it is, and I go to him, and I and I'm, and when I when I start that prayer, I'm selfish in nature. It seems like, Lord, take this away, do this, change this. And as I pray, pray, and as I hear myself, and and I realize who I'm talking to again, and I have opportunity to just take a moment to breathe. You know, we kind of graduate to the end of that prayer where we say, Lord, not my will, but yours. And we begin to realize, we begin to mimic that prayer that Jesus later would say in the garden himself, right? And so prayer to me, so many times as I bow my head, seems to be therapeutic to me. It puts me back in the right frame of mind. It, it gets me more centered, more focused on, okay, maybe what's really important um, or, or, or to, to lay down the thing that has bothered me so bad here for the last whatever um, and so I think verse 8 illustrates that. Do not be like them, for their father knows, for your father knows what you need before you ask. And then he illustrates 
uh, a proper prayer. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Remember last week we illustrated or we're talking about uh, the Jubilee year and we're talking about that seven times 70 and the, the uh, importance of numbers and, and how um, this language is, is numeric in nature with, with every, with every uh, letter there is a number associated with this language. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Actually, Christ himself will become our daily bread. And when you think about that, when you think about that prayer, that, that way we might look at that today, give us this day our daily bread, we're asking perhaps for forgiveness from, from, from the one who we attain that through himself. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that's our verse. That's, that's what we're focused on. Uh, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And New American Standard, I think most of your verses translate it that way. It is a, a, a money term. It is a, a borrowing and lending and, and, and payment term here. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, and then verse 13, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, for yours is the kingdom and the power of the glory forever. Amen. Now, notice verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others... Then your father will not forgive your transgressions. That's the theme, or that's what we've been talking about here. Isn't it interesting at the end of this prayer, what we often call it the model prayer, I, I would suggest not one to be repeated uh, or, or to be used as, as a repetitive prayer, but to have the elements of the things that we would pray for. He talks about one of the facets within that prayer, and then it starts to make me wonder if you dedicate Jesus to uh, or or this, this phrase at the end of this prayer, how much of this prayer is actually about forgiveness or about the attitude contained within that ability of forgiveness of one another. Look how important that apparently is that Jesus would say at the end of that, for if you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And so obviously critical, very critical. Very important. Any thoughts about these passages before we move on? <clears throat> um, so, where I'd like us to head to here in a few moments is is one of Jesus' parables. Um, we talked about several things at the end of class last week. Um, we talked about the rabbinic uh, teachers using Amos chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 2, verse 1, uh, as to um, looking at forgiveness as uh, uh, being offered seven times. You remember at this time, the, the priests, and, and really, I would say, a, 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 I mean, we don't know, but I would say a, a great amount of people, or a great amount of God's people at this time, were were concerned about legalism. They wanted to know what they had to do. They weren't interested in going further. They were just interested in fulfillment or, mm -hmm. or doing whatever was said. And so they were straining for these things to have a, a, an absolute or a number on them. And it, that's called legalism. And so with this, they were, they were coming up with, with the thoughts in Amos as... Um, we need to forgive seven times. And of course, we've got this episode coming up where we're told, no, not seven, but seven times seven, or seven times seven, you know, which is a much different number. And so uh, that's, that's kind of something we looked at last week in, in this discussion of, of uh, legalism or in this number. With that came the Jubilee. Uh, remember, the Jubilee was was to gain freedom from slavery and debt. Uh, that's found in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 through 55, or the outline of the Jubilee years. There were three ways in which this happened. And there was a Sabbath. A Sabbath is a day of rest. This is refer referred to then as a year of rest. A Sabbath for the land. The land would sit fallow. So where their normal practice was to farm or to cultivate every year to bring in a crop. 
that year it was left fallow. So there would obviously be preparation for this, as something to remember to consider. It was also a Sabbath uh, for the redemption of property. So a property had been traded or lost uh, due to debts or to um, circumstances that could be returned. In, in this society, it was important because it was of a family nature. And, and I think that's a, a lot of the reason why that took place. There was also a Sabbath then or a redemption of slaves. And so if one had been caught up into slavery because of some reason, that would be a time of release. And so you would have this great reset uh, in, in, in these, uh, at these times. Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 14. And this is all kind of getting ready for our parable. Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> and let's start at like verse um, um, Oh, excuse me, Luke 4 I'm, I'm looking at it and not recognizing any of Luke chapter 4, I'm sorry Luke chapter 4. Uh, we have at the beginning of the, of the chapter, the temptation of Jesus, where Satan carries him away and he is tempted. And we're familiar with that. Um, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding uh, district. He began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And it, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Uh, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed to me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, pro proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, and, and this really seems to point to the idea of, of the Jubilee. And so Jesus, using Isaiah here, is proclaiming to be the Jubilee of all Jubilees. And, and why? Because it's not just a Sabbath for uh, the clearing of land or, 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 or the laying idol of land or, or the redemption of, of property or... Uh, a Sabbath for uh, the release of slaves, but for even the 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 release the release or the debt of sin, and that that was his purpose, and that's why he had come. And so he very boldly takes this passage of Isaiah and relates it to himself. Uh, and if you think about this setting and what this looked like, this this must have been really something. Uh, and so we have we have. Um, a continual um, illustration of sin and its wages as being a, a debt, a, a, something monetary that you and I can all relate to, and then the forgiveness of that. Any thoughts about about the Jubilee or uh, Luke chapter four? <clears throat> Let's turn into Matthew chapter 18. And, and we're going we're gonna to look at the, the parable um, that we, we just alluded to last week. Uh, a parable very familiar to all of us. But in verse 21 of chapter 18 of Matthew... Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall I, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Uh, what's significant about, about, um, about Peter's idea here about seven times? Anybody have any thoughts about that? Okay, seven is a complete number. And would, would Peter have felt that was going above and beyond? He, he would, and that's why he used seven. Um, he, he felt that surely 
This, this is substantial, right? Uh, Jesus said to him, verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And I think, I think we alluded to this last week. This then really um, it, it is a number. But really, what is Jesus saying about forgiving our brother? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and, and so, but, but it, even though that does equal a number, which is significant, uh, it, it, it means that we always forgive. It means that, that there never comes a time when our brother comes to us and asks for forgiveness that we don't offer it. Um, in verse 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Uh, and so many times uh, uh, a parable starts like this, right? Uh, the kingdom of heaven may be compared. And then we have uh, the parable. And so, uh, again, so uh, influential, so easy to teach. Um, understandable are these, uh, and, and timeless really too. And I think the more we research these, the more we find out idiosyncrasies about the day and what, what, what the imagery that Jesus is overlaying. And when we find those things out, they even mean more, and to, more to us. But uh, even to uh, the, the first-time reader, these just make sense, right? Um, and so he says, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Uh, settle there has some, some significance. This, again, is financial in nature. Uh, so that, that continues. He's borrowing again from that theme to help us understand uh, the nature or uh, the way in which this debt works. Verse 24, when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Um, so you know the story, right? Is this a great sum or is this a small sum? <laughs> It's a great sum, right? It is, it is such a great sum that the idea is here that, that payment from a slave would be impossible. Uh, notice in verse 23, it says, Settle accounts with his slaves. There's no way this person will repay this amount. It just is not possible. In fact, um, one of the thoughts was, was this would be such a great sum. We're always, we always think about this. We'll, we'll say this to somebody. Well, they've got so much in the bank they can live off the interest, right? Well, the same works in Congress. You can owe so much money that keeping up with the payment on the interest is unbearable. This is, in fact, the place that our country's finances are in. We are having trouble maintaining the interest on the money that's borrowed, not the money that's borrowed. The interest on the money that's borrowed. And I read a really interesting comparison to this. If you think about this in terms of money, okay, this, this slave will never be able to pay this back. It would be a comparison of um, sins of commission and omission. What's a sin of commission? You, you know what you're doing, right? You decide to sin. You, you recognize it, okay? What's a sin of omission? You don't so much recognize it. It's maybe something left behind, something you should have done. It, it was a shortcoming in your day. But you maybe got to evening and didn't even realize it. The sin of commission would be the principle. The sin of omission would be the interest. And I think that's, that's something crazy to think about, right? So you have a principle, but then there's an interest. And this person can't keep up with the interest. He just can't do it. Uh, and so there's this, there's this great problem. Um, once again, verse 24. Uh, when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Notice when he began to settle them. Um, what would it mean to settle on a... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I, I 
seven times seven, mm -hmm. even with single finishing and mm -hmm. single omission. Right. So it's it's always important to remember that no matter how many times we do mess up, right, he's gonna forgive us as right. long as we genuinely mean it. Right. right. Or I'm sorry. Yeah. And that's something important to remember as well. Right. This this is on the other spectrum of legalism mm -hmm. that we started to talk about what what must I do? What do I, what what is really the attitude? What's the what is the least that I have to do? Is what we're concerned about with with the thought of legalism. Yeah, good point. What does it mean to settle with them? Make right. Make right. Yeah, you know, sometimes I think um, uh, you go along, and all of a sudden you need a spot where you make. Um, you find out where you're at. And that's what's going on here. You know, um, in, in the big scheme of things, or the big picture, we might think of this as some type of judgment, some type of uh, um, uh, a, a place in a person's life where all of a sudden debts are called, called, um, are, are called due. Uh, it, but at any rate, the king wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. Uh, and he began to settle them then, and this one is brought to him uh, with, with this outstanding uh, sum. One more thing about yeah. settling is that the debt does not go away, but it is forgiven. Like there is mm -hmm. still, so when you settle some, anything, it means that the original terms of the agreement cannot be met or will not be met However, it will not be held against you. Mm -hmm. You know, like those uh, auxiliary things that are required may no longer, I mean, there's still a need for them, but you're no longer accountable for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the passage that we looked at in Luke about us forgiving one another is a measure of grace being offered is how that would read. And so, um, yeah, there's definitely something to that. Um, any, anybody else? Yes, Marcia. Um, there's a saying that um, a pound of flesh, like to mm -hmm. get get back what you're owed, you mm -hmm. lose your pound of flesh. But it's like Jesus gave mm -hmm. the flesh. Right, right, pay. absolutely. And and we're ultimately, you know, keeping that in mind. Uh, how all of this works, and and it's important to remember because now we're talking about between one another here before long, and so we see. We, we see um, a great disparity, I guess you would say, be between the two. Anybody else hear verse 24? Yes, Mark. I was reading back in Leviticus 25 talking about the year of Jubilee, and yep. I found amazing that if you had bought the land in the last couple of years, you had to go back and reassess what you paid for that mm -hmm. land. If it was better than you thought and it produced better than you thought, mm -hmm. you're supposed to go back and compensate, compensate that person for it, and if it did poorly, the person that sold it was supposed to compensate the guy that did it. So mm -hmm. it was really a looking back and trying to make amends of things that you didn't even know were wrong at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Anybody else? Yes. Kind of on the same lines of Mark, I mean, when, the, when you look at the year of Jubilee, it was to be celebrated every 50 years, mm -hmm. and it meant canceling all the debts. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it you would have followed that practice, which we don't have it recorded in the Bible, but the Israelites carried it out, because they didn't carry it out, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And if they would have, it would have been the perfect nation. They would have had no debt. There would have been no slavery kind of thing going on. And it would have been the perfect society. But yeah, I am sure that as God's people relented or, or failed to uh, fulfill their obligations with God, the Jubilee suffered as well, yeah. obviously. Um, what, what's so interesting, you know, in, in our whole theme is, is about taking the prophecies and seeing the fulfillments of those this year. Um, it added a tremendous layer again to the coming of Christ and the forgiveness of these things. And, and what's, what's so interesting about that, God's people needed a forgiveness that they didn't realize they needed. And so... What, what they were looking for does not come, but something far more valuable came that they didn't even realize they needed. 
Uh, but isn't it interesting how those around them, so many others, displayed a greater faith, a greater desire than God's own, God's own people did. And some of them recognized the need that they had. Uh, it's really something if you think about it. Even though they had all the tools before them, it's like they just, they just couldn't see it. They couldn't put two and two together. Anybody else? Who's 24? Yes. So going back to the idea that the debt is still kind of there, you know, I hear people sometimes say, I, I just can't forgive that because, you know, it, it was just wrong. And if I forgive them, it's saying that it was okay. Mm -hmm. But it's like the, the whole idea of forgiveness is that a wrong was done. Mm -hmm. If a wrong wasn't done, there would be no need for forgiveness. But you know, I, I, would, I would clarify um, and illustrate this way. It's not that the debt is absolved. It's not that it 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 just it's just um, uh, evaporates, if you will, because there was a tremendous price paid for those sins, and we recognize that as Christ's blood. And so, you know, the Old Testament was atonement. But there's something better in the new, and that is actual true forgiveness. So they don't, they don't disappear, but they are handled. And, and with, with that handling, then they go away. Then they are forgotten by our God. And so that's, that's, that's what we're coming to, though, here with this relationship with you and I. Let's continue on, verse 25. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had, and repayment to be made. Um, the framework of this parable is taken from human law. The spiritual meaning lying below the imagery is that the debt is overwhelming. In other words, God is not going to uh, attach my sins to my wife and my children. That is just the framework of the parable that he's using. What he's saying is, look how costly this debt is. And it is great. It is great. I've heard, I've heard people say, well, I know my place at, at, at life's end is hell. And they go on continuing living, being comfortable in saying that. I am convinced they do not realize how terrible the debt is. Or you would never utter those words, whether or not you thought them or not. You just want to do that. But, but I think what's being illustrated here by, by uh, um, his own family being taken hostage as well, until all would be repaid, is, is showing us how, how great the debt is. Any thoughts on verse 25? Verse 26. Uh, so that slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. First of all, he prostrated himself on the ground. What does that mean? What, 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 what does his appearance look like at this point? He just went on the floor with his face to the ground. Yep. Just stretched out. He won't even pick his head up. Yeah. He, he, is, he is laying himself out before his king, um, uh, totally vulnerable, um, and... and, and Pleading with him, and he says, "Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything." Um, it's not possible. It, it, it just in the imagery of the of the parables being said, and what 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 Jesus is drawing here, uh, it's it's impossible for this slave to repay this debt. And we mentioned that 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 principle and the interest, and in, and if he would not even be keeping up with that interest, he would never pay. The, the principle. It just can't happen. Um, you know what's interesting about this? Uh, if you think about this from, from a theological standpoint, he's saying, I will repay thee. Hoping to settle the account, he, he is hoping to be justified by work so he will score righteous acts in the future to offset transgressions in the past. In other words, he, he wants, you know, this would almost be akin to being justified by works. 
He can't get out of this. He cannot escape this death. And you and I cannot do enough good things to compensate for the bad things because even if that did work, we continue to do bad things. We cannot be justified by works. We need something more. And that's exactly what happens in this case. Verse 27, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. <coughs> You know, one of the goals of this class was to understand the, the, the grandeur of the cost of sin and the grandeur of, the, uh, of forgiveness. And as bad as sin is, and as terrible as sin is, remember, one sin equals what? Death. And yet, we are offered forgiveness. Now we need to consider that forgiveness. How great is that forgiveness? And it, it, it's, it's because it's coming from God. It's because um, he has this great compassion for you and I. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion. Remember, he has prostrated himself. He's humbled himself before him and released him and forgave him the debt. Once again, very much financial terminology being used in verse 27. The, the imagery here continues. Any thoughts through verse 27? You know, to kind of remind you of the parable of the uh, unjust steward and, and the parable of the talents. Uh, our life with all of its opportunity is really lent to us and God requires repayment with interest. If you think about, about that uh, parable, um, remember there were different levels of talents or different, different amounts given out and those, those slaves or those servants did various things, right? The one that had been given much uh, returned much. The one that was given uh, slightly less returned more, but slightly less. And the one that was given one talent did what? Buried it. Buried it. Simply returned what he was given, and was that enough? No. In fact, God requires more of us. And uh, so it, it, it just kind of makes you think about, about that when we, when we come to this to this individual, uh, the, the amount that was forgiven, uh, the way in which uh, the Lord of that slave felt compassion and forgave him. Any, ver any thoughts, 27? I think compassion is a big part of this because God understands what we're going through. I mean, we're, we bring it upon ourselves when we sin, but he under Jesus came to earth as a human. He understands what temptation is. He doesn't actually understand. Well, I mean, he understands because he's a human. Right, right. And so his compassion is what moved him to do this. Right. He understood. It's like, yeah. you got no other choice. You, you need a savior in there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay, verse 28, it all goes awry, right? Verse 28, but when that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owned him a hundred denarii, he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. Now, the, the, the uh, reading of this leads us, leads us to believe that he no more than walks out of the palace and finds one that owes him, right? And this one owes him 100 denarii. Now, I know the, the, the imagery here is he's just been released of this great sum, and now he goes and finds a fellow slave who owes him uh, you know, literally a couple bucks. Well, it's not quite that. 100 denarii was about 100 days' wages. Or, if you convert that into food, would be enough, enough uh, to feed 2,500 men. So, Jesus, speaking to the fishermen, this would be a sum of money. This would not be an insequential amount of, of money. And yet, we know that the imagery is of a great debt to a small. And when put in comparison to the debt that God has released us from, it is... Very, very small. And so, once again, back to that thought of where, where our mind starts, just like with that prayer. We start with, with a big problem, right? And hopefully we finish with an inconvenience. <laughs> you know, it's just when we're put in the right frame of mind, we realize this, this, this is not much at all. And so even though this, this is 100 days wages, 
um, it is, is very small in comparison to what has just been done for him. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he sees him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. Verse 29. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. Sounds eerily similar to what he had just done before his Lord, right? Same type of attitude, uh, falling down before him, prostrating himself before him, and pleading, I will repay you. Verse 30. Um, but he was unwilling and went through him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So we really have roles being reversed here, right? The man who was who received forgiveness is now judge, arbiter, or, or uh, creditor. And he looks at this fellow slave and he is unwilling and went through him into prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now, um, if you read... Um, uh, individuals that, that have studied this time period, they would say one slave could not throw another slave into prison. He could not legally do this. But Jesus would be drawing uh, this or saying this with the thought that look at the inconsistency here. This slave will now actually imprison his fellow slave uh, and, and require of him repayment. That one or two done. Two, okay. Verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Now, we'll finish here in verse 31. But it says they were deeply grieved, or some of your versions read, sorry or had sorrow. What would your first reaction to seeing this be? When Nathan, I think it was, came to David, right? I look at Rhonda because <laughs> she kills this kind of stuff. <laughs> Proved it again Wednesday night. Nathan came to David, right? Said, told him the story of the little lamb. What was David's reaction? Oh, he's ready to take that man's life, wasn't he? And Nathan pointed the finger at him and said, it's you. That would be my first reaction upon seeing this. I'm pretty sure. But the fellow slaves were grieved. Or had sorrow. Or were sorry. Think about this this next week. We'll pick that up there. Maybe that's the attitude we're supposed to have when we see injustice between us. Any last comments? Okay, thanks for your attention.